Now, we would like to invite Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business, Bapak Teguh Dartanto, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Bapak Teguh Dartanto, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning. Uh, Ibu Profesor Sabrina Sadi, wife and relatives of the late Profesor Muhammad Sadli, Profesor Emeritus Mailing Oi Gardiner, representative of ANU Indonesian Projects, uh, uh, Bapak Firman Witular dan Ibu Lydia, the speaker of the 17 uh, Sadli Lecture, Profesor Lisa Kemerun, Director of, of Institute for Economic and Social Research, Bapak Cek Al-Nur Yakin, and also uh, distinguished uh, discussion here, Pak Asep Suryadi Ibu Niki, uh, dan moderator, Ibu uh, Dia Setio Naluri, Ibu Ruri, and distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, who are attending uh, offline here and also uh, those who, uh, who are attending uh, online. It is a great honor for me to welcome uh, all of you to the 17th Sadri Lecture. The theme of this year lecture is the Gender Inequality and Development Indonesia in the Global Context. This is, I think, the, the first time that uh, Saturday lecture discussing about the gender issues, if I'm not mistaken. In navigating in the designing, choosing, and implementing a government's program, Indonesia gender issues are one of the area that carefully design and use a data-driven approach, partly due to the strong commitment from the government, international agency, and the research communities. The collaborations among scholars and policy makers are mutual in the context of giving input and giving the insight uh, to improve uh, the policy implementation in Indonesia. Good policies are generally driven from the good continuous research. Research collaboration is the pathway of creating a larger network of a needed continuous research with at the same time can essentially communicating the research result to the policy makers and the public. Good research and environment that support uh, it and the university including research center uh, area is, is very, very important. This is, I believe, a spirit of the Saturday lecture that have been conducted over the, the last 17 years as the collaborations among universities, especially in the as Australian National Universities and uh, our uh, University of Indonesia. Since 2007, LPM, FAB, and the ANU Indonesia Project have jointly organized the annual SETI lecture series to broaden understanding and stimulate debate among academics and policymakers of the key, at the key economics policy challenges faced by Indonesia. I think this is very important to have like a broader perspective, historical experience from, from not only from Indonesia, from the other countries for uh, providing the feedback to the policy maker in Indonesia. It is named in honor of the late Professor Muhammad Sadli, former director of LPEM FABUI, uh, the professor uh, in our school, Faculty of Economic and Business, and one of the Indonesia most influenced economists during his lifetime. Not only this uh, lecture, that in our faculty also we have like the Sadli Indo chair here that provide a research grant for uh, the young professor, the young faculty member to becoming, uh, to encourage them to becoming the full professor and also becoming the good researcher. To preserve his legacy for Indonesia, the Faculty of Economic and Business Research Indonesia has continued uh, to have the, our network with the international community and nurture research talent in our research institute and faculties. This year is special as a beginning in 2023 in the Saturday lecture will also include the topic as I mentioned previously is gender uh, equality and the social inclusion because you know it's the time of the mainstreaming the issue of diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, also gender 
get see something like a social inclusion and 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 and, and uh, uh, disability something like that. So this is uh, this topic is in honor of the professor Emeritus uh, Saparina Sadli, a, a distinguished scholar, leader, and advocate for the human rights, social justice, and gender equality in Indonesia. The scope of the series will expand to cover gender equality and the social justice in additional to the international trade, industrial organization, development economics, with uh, one of the focus areas of uh, Professor Sadli. I would like to give my highest appreciation to Ibu Professor Safarina Sadli, uh, notable scholar staff and wife of the late Professor Mamat Saltiwa here with us and to the LPM, FABOE, and the ANU Indonesia Project for their excellent arrangement of the 17th uh, Saturday Lecture. The 17th uh, collab cooperation is surely quite a long engagement. I think this is not many uh, events in Indonesia can continue uh, almost two decades, uh, but this is uh, uh, very good to have a long collaboration between the ANU and also our faculty. I would like also thanks to the Professor Lisa Kamerun, who will discuss her paper here, and we also have conducted for a long time research on development in Indonesia, especially on gender response related program. And thank you very much for discussion, uh, Pak Asep Surya Hadi from Smeru, and Ibu Fendi Futu Keniki. This is our young faculty member just recruited recruited in this year as a permanent one and Pak Firman Witular from ANU, Pak Jaikal Nuryakin and also uh, others uh, participants and uh, that coming to, to this event. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants of the 17th Saturday lecture. I wish you all have a, a fruitful discussion on the topic, gender uh, related issues, hopefully that to know and to understand as well as the challenge uh, of the issue uh, what happened that um, this issue can be mainstreaming in Indonesia's development policy. I think this is the most important. And we, ourselves at our faculty, also trying to consider about issues of the disability, issue of the equity and inclusion. And maybe we have to collaborate with Pururi and the others that to make our faculty becoming more uh, woman friendly. Uh, because I think we have to commit to support the young faculty member, for example, having daycare or something like that. This is uh, still uh, our homework as a dean, that making our institutions more gender-friendly uh, environment. And uh, thank you very much for all. And I'm sorry I could, I could not stay here, even though this is a very interesting topic, because I have to... Oh, Pusadli, uh, welcome. Uh, Okay, welcome to Sadli at our faculty. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I have to leave uh, this forum because I have to catch my, my flight go to the uh, Vancouver. I'm sorry, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Bapak Teguh Dartanto, thank you for your remarks. And welcome to Professor Emeritus Saparina Sadli. Uh, to our auditorium here. Oh, okay. Uh, before continuing to our next session, we would like to invite all speakers, discussants, and chair, Bapak Teguh Dartanto, Professor Meiling Oi, Professor Lisa Cameron, Bapak Asep Suryahadi, Ibu Putu Geni Kinati, and Ibu Diahadi Setio Naluri to come to the stage for a brief photo session. We also invite uh, Ibu Professor Saparina Sadli to join the photo session. Please come forward.
Thank you for all speakers and discussions. All speaker and discussions may be seated. Okay. Now, to formally open the 17th Sadly Lecture, we would like to invite Professor Emeritus Meiling Oi Gardiner from Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia, to deliver her keynote remarks. Without further ado, Professor Mailing, the platform is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi pada semua. Good morning to all. Uh, I, I, I was asked to give a few remarks, and my remarks concern, of course, Pusat, my idol. And I'm sorry, I have to read because, you know, I can't remember anymore what I want to say. So I do have to read my notes. Um, I'm speaking here for Professor Saparina Sadli. She has always been an inspiring idol of women's rights and of mine. What an honor. First of all, allow me to thank the organizing committee of the 17th Sadli Lecture and more specific, PUSAP, who, who I understand made the request for me to give a few introductory remarks. Thank you for the honor to all of you. It was in late 1980s when I received a telephone call to meet Professor Sadli, Saparina Sadli, I mean. <laughs> she was an, already an important person in the university surroundings. Well, I was just a young academic in search of a focus for my future career. It all came together for me as the daughter of my mom, a journalist uh, with her own magazine, well, she had to run it on her own, often writing articles on women's disadvantaged position in a community. She often reminded me what it means to be a girl a woman living with numerous constraints, not imposed on boys and men as members of the family or of society. Pusat, as she was better known, challenged me and directed my future tra trajectory as she experienced and was, has done for many others. She offered me to chair a national study on women-headed households. It was based on the results of the 1980 population census of Indonesia. I was shocked by, uh, I was shocked by the offer coming from her, who at that time, she was already a prominent figure in the Jakarta academic scene as a focal voice and harbinger of for women, for women's struggle to gain her rightful position and role in society. Unbecoming, Busab's distinction started when she became dean of the faculty of economic, uh, <laughs> of the faculty of psychology, of course, keep on thinking, <laughs> at the University of Indonesia in 1976, which she led until 1981. But her path to prominence was a hard-earned struggle against initial difficulties to reach potential students throughout the country who can be interested in learning about prevailing gender, gender inequalities. She acknowledged that she has always been aware of differential treatment between her and her brother and the family and emphasized 
that the preferences were exhibited in terms of access to education, were not exhibited in terms of preferences for uh, access to education. Pusap managed to make herself aware of women's achievements, as symbolized, for instance, Indonesia exemplary Raden Ajeng Kartini of in the late uh, 19, uh, 1800s to, and she died in 1904. And also European widely celebrated physicist and chemist Marie Curie. I got these from Carla Bu. So. Her understanding about the role of women was strengthened from reading half the human experience, the psychology of women by Janet Shibley Hyde. Considering that at that time, most psychology literature was masculine, dominated by men, and studied about and through the lenses of men. It made her understand reasons for child marriage attributed to culture and tradition and due to poverty. Her chance to realize her desires to implement a program which will improve Indonesian women's position and role when together with Professor Tapi Omas Ihromi, Pusap was asked by the rector of Universitas Indonesia to start a graduate program in women's studies in 1989 the first of its kind in the country. At that time, the Indonesian science uh, academic community did not easily adapt to international movements. While the issue of women and development had already emerged since the 1960s, the Indonesian government introduced the first state minister of women's affairs in 1978, and yet, it still took another decade before academia took up the challenge to study women's position and role in Indonesian society. In spite of a difficult start of warnings and opposition on theory and action, Pusap persevered and continued taking charge of the program for a decade until the end of the century. This gave her public stature and voice to be heard and considered, not limited to academia, but also among activists, the government, and also in politics. As Indonesia became increasingly engulfed in socioeconomic and political turmoil, she became increasingly convinced that she had to join and even lead the path to justice, a true leader. It was Pusap's leadership and voice which made even the president of the World Bank to succumb to the demands of a group of women activists who demanded to meet with him, having declined an earlier offer to meet with his wife. After a final negotiation on location and attendees, the meeting concluded with an agreement between the bank and the government to allocate 20% of labor-intensive jobs to be created with the bank's funding, uh, funding assistance for the worst affected populations by the 1998 financial crisis hitting the archipelago. It was the socio-political turmoil of the time which gave rise to the establishment of the Lotus Foundation. What's up? I hope you remember. In pursuit of women's rights, as, and as human rights. This underlying ideology was the driving force for Busab to lead a group of women from a variety of backgrounds in terms of age, interest, profession, organizational and political affiliation, all sharing a common trepidation arising from what Pian Pun uh, calls the atrocities and violence against women during the 1998 socio-political turbulence that swept the country with horrifying events of mass rapes and plunder. This group became the embryo which marched to the palace to meet with the then President Habibi 
to request acknowledgement and condemnation of those atrocities. She was joined by some 21 women representing a variety of backgrounds such as social class, academics, professions, ethnicity, and young and old activists, as well as government women's institutions as the Dharma Vanita, Dharma Pertiwi, and Kowani. Well, initially barred by the military, they eventually agreed to only push submit with the president. This overture was immediately rejected, as her position was all or none. And finally, all 22 women um, were ushered into the palace to meet with, the pres with President Habibi. After fairly long-winded negotiations, the final outcome was a statement, which was later read by the president before a waiting TV crew. This was the first time the government acknowledged and condemned the roles and violence against women. He also promised to set up a team to investigate the May 13 to 15, 1998 rights and rapes and establish a national commission on violence against women. While well, Busab joined the fact-finding mission, uh, the fact-finding joint investigation team as a member, the establishment of the National Commission was tasked to Professor Saparina Sadli, who naturally became the first chair for the period 1998 to 2004. Acknowledgement. Given the social stature and public popularity, it's no surprise. She drew the attention of various bodies to bestow her with an award. The first came from the University of Kajamada UGM in Yogyakarta, with the Anugraha Mengku the IX in 2004. That was followed by the Asia a Special Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. In the following year, in 2009, she received the Tsandakyawan Berdedikasi Harian Kompas Award. Then she was the recipient of the Nabil Award in 2011. And most recently, one of her close friends, Professor Tuti Herati, who sadly has passed away in, 19, uh, in 2021, conferred on her the Rosina Award in 2021. In return, it was Busab's leadership and incessant commitment to justice for the weak and disadvantaged, especially women, which enticed many of us to be her followers, and that includes me. In line with Busab's conscious cooperation with the younger generation, we decided to establish the Saparina Sadli Award. The purpose of this award is to acknowledge women living in various parts of the archipelago. Yet, like Busab, are pioneers in their own right, upholding human rights for justice and humanity. Over the years, five awardees coming from Jakarta, West Timor, Central Sulawesi, the Malaccas, and Ateh have been presented with the Saparina Sadli Award. Thank you, Busan. Professor Mailing, thank you for opening the event and sharing your perspective. Since 2007, LPAM, FABUE, NDA, New Indonesia Project have jointly organized the annual Sadly Lecture Series to broaden the understanding and stimulate debate among students, academics, and policymakers of the key economic policy challenges faced by Indonesia. The lecture is named in the honor of the late Professor Muhammad Sadli, who was one of the Indonesia's most influential commentators on economic affairs during his lifetime. 
Beginning in 2023, the Sadly Lecture will also include topics in gender equality and social inclusion in the honor of Professor Emeritus Saparina Sadli, a distinguished scholar, leader, and advocate for human rights, social justice, and gender equality in Indonesia. This year's lecture will be given by Lisa Cameron, James Riadi, Chair of Asian Economics and Business, and a professorial research fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research, the University of Melbourne. Before we proceed to today's lecture, we would like to invite Ibu Dia Hadi Setio Naluri, PhD, as the chair for today's lecture. Ibu Ruri is the head of graduate program in Population and Labor Studies, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia. Ibu Ruri, the stage is yours. Um, good morning, Ibu and Bapa Skalian. Um, good afternoon and good evening, maybe from for everyone who is dialed in uh, from Zoom. So um, I'm very honored today to be the moderator for today's lecture uh, on gender equality uh, in economic and development, uh, which will be delivered by Professor Lisa Cameron. Um, yang terhormat Ibu Saparina Sadli, Ibu Professor Meling Oi Gardiner, uh, Pak Firman dari ANU Indonesia Project, Pak Dekan yang sudah uh, pergi, Pak Caikal, the director of LPM. Um, Allow me to uh, reflect a little bit. Uh, since last, last year, we had the Indonesia Update Conference that has the same theme on gender equality. So in that conference, we uh, brought to the center the discussion about uh, the progress of how Indonesia progressing in gender equality, gender relation. And we see um, there are, we have a progress uh, from the increased representation in politics and leadership. We also see some progress in the increase, uh, sorry, improvement in gender gap in education. And also we see that the parliament has passed the sexual violence uh, victims protection bills into law. Uh, but on the other side, we also see some challenges despite of considerable changes in the, to the Indonesian economy including a stagnant female labor force participation rate that Lisa will uh, discuss today, and uh, gender gap, persistent violence against women. And I think these challenges stem from pervasive patriarchy influence social norms that cause women to be left behind in terms of access, participation, control, and benefiting from development. So today, uh, we have Professor Lisa Cameron, uh, who will discuss how Indonesia fares in terms of the effort to close gender inequality from gender economics perspective. And she will walk us through uh, to Indonesia performance compared to other countries, going deep dive to examine factors contributing to the stubborn low female labor force participation from her extensive research on gender and what could be done uh, moving forward uh, to address these challenges. So allow me to read again your bio, Lisa. <laughs> so Lisa Cameron is James Riyadi Chair of Asian Economics and Business and a Professorial Research Fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne. She is an empirical microeconomist whose research incorporates the techniques of experimental and behavioral economics so as to better understand human decision making. Uh, much of her research focuses on policy evaluation, understanding the impacts and behavioral implication of public policy with a focus on social and economic issues. She is particularly interested in the welfare of disadvantaged and marginalized groups and the socioeconomic determinants of health, particularly in developing countries, including Indonesia. So Lisa received her PhD in economics from Princeton U University writing her dissertation under the supervision of the Nobel laureate. She was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Science in 2013. Now I would like to ask Lisa to come up to the stage and sit. Excellent. 
And joining uh, Lisa, so after the general lecture, we will have two distinguished discussion. So the first uh, discussion is our dearest uh, Putu Geniki Nati, or we call her uh, Niki. She is from Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia. Um, Niki supports the outreach team at Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative with analyzing survey data for the development of national multidimensional poverty indices. Um, this has involved working on highlighting existing deprivations across health, education, and living standard within various population. She is now uh, the head of the international office at the Faculty of Economics and Business here at UI. She also teaches microeconomics and econometrics, and I think she invites all of her students to attend this uh, uh, lecture today. And before OPI and at UI, uh, Nikki serves as a tutor at Cable and St. John's Colleges at the University of Oxford. Uh, she was working at the Bluffat Nick School of Government on project tackling digital inequality. She was a Jardine Scholar at Trinity College, University of Oxford, where she completed her PhD. I invite Nikki to join us at the stage. The next distinguished discussion is Bapak Dr. Asep Surya Hadi. I don't think I need, uh, we need more introduction about Pak Asep, <laughs> but uh, we all know Pak Asep very well. Um, just briefly about her is bio. Pak Asep is a Smeru Senior Research Fellow whose role is to ensure quality research result and to encourage policymakers to formulate policies based on research evidence. And this is carried out by acting as an advisor, on research and publication, contributing to building of uh, the capacity of researchers to quality assurance and improvement in research, and also helping to influence policy making with the evidence uh, of research result. Uh, before joining Smeru, Pa Asep working uh, with the World Bank Office and was a senior research associate at Center for Policy and Implementation Studies, CPIS. And Pa Asep was awarded with HWR Prize for his article on minimum wage policy and its impact on employment in the urban formal sector, published in the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies, uh, co-writing with Wenefrida Widianti and Daniel Perwira and Sudarno Sumarto. And this is prize is given to the best article by one or more Indonesian author published in the, by BIES this year. I would like to invite Pa Asep to join us in the stage. Now let's, uh, now we go into the, the center of the lecture. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Lisa Cameron to deliver her lecture. Please, Lisa. Thank you, Ruri. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And I'd like to thank my hosts at the University of Indonesia and uh, the Indonesia Project at the ANU for the invitation. And it's a real honour to be here to speak at the, um, the Sadley Lecture uh, in honour of Professor Saparina Sadley, who's made such significant contributions to women's equality uh, in Indonesia, both as a research scholar and on the ground, uh, improving the lives of women. So it's a real honour to be here. And uh, I look forward to your comments and some discussion after my talk. So I'm going to be talking on gender equality and development, and comparing Indonesia to other countries across the world and in, and, uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. Oops, there we go. Yeah. So I'm going to start by talking about um, global gender inequality and comparing Indonesia with other countries in the region. And then I'm going to go on and talk about a recent uh, research project, uh, which is with Diana Contreras Suarez, my co-author at the University of Melbourne, and Ruri here at the University of Indonesia, um, looking at how to influence social norms around women's work. But before I start, I just thought I wanted to acknowledge and celebrate the increased interest in uh, research on gender equality, particularly in the field of economics. So what I did is I did a search on EconList um, of 
research papers with gender in the title. And I did this just for across the world. And so the blue line graphs what I found. So in the 1970s, there were only six articles that had the word gender in the title. Um, these are articles in the field of economics. In the 1980s, it's increased to 122. And you can see that for the two, for 2020s, um, I'm projecting that it looks like there's going to be more than 10,000 articles with gender in the um, title. So that's a massive increase in interest. Uh, and you can see that also being mirrored in the Indonesian literature. Now, these are just studies, English language studies, so there would be more studies, but I, I was using econolition. Um, and so, you know, in the 70s and 80s, there were no studies written in English with um, Indonesia and uh, gender in the title. By the 1980s, there were eight, and that included a study by Professor Ling. We gardener here. Um, in the 19, uh, in the 2000s, that went up to eight, um, and I contributed one article in that year. And a number of scholars at the ANU also contributed articles on gender in Indonesia in that year. I think Sharon Bessel, Catherine Robinson, and Susan Blackburn. Um, and the numbers continue to grow in Indonesia. So this is really promising in terms of our understanding of gen gender inequality or equality and how to um, improve gender equality over time. So. When compared, you know, the indices all differ somewhat from one another. This ind index is made up of, of four sub-indices. Uh, there's one uh, aspect looks at economic participation and opportunity. So it's constructed from indicators looking at women's labour force participation, gender wage gaps, the share of women in professional, technical, senior management and legislative roles, and, and women's share of earned income. The second component of the index looks at educational attainment, and that's measured by literacy, school enrolment, and tertiary education. Uh, so differences between men and women in those indicators. The third component is health and survival. That looks at the sex ratio at birth uh, and at life expectancy. So to identify whether there's sun bias um, being borne out in the, um, the sex ratio due to uh, female infanticide or sex selective abortions. Um, the fourth component, it looks at political empowerment. So the number of women in parliament, in ministerial positions, years with a female head of state in the last 50 years. So I'm just gonna present a number of figures. So here um, I've graphed uh, the gender gap index. So the higher the value of that index, the more equal uh, in terms of gender the society is. And I've graphed that against GB, GDP per capita in international dollars. Um, and Indonesia is shown there in yellow, uh, but I've also just highlighted some other countries of interest, Australia, the US, Afghanistan, which is the, um, has the highest gender equality, in gender inequality in the world, and Iceland, which is, has the lowest gender inequality in the world. In the previous figure, I didn't have them, I had excluded the Middle Eastern oil countries. Here they're included in grey, and you can see that they all have high levels of income and relatively low levels of gender equality. So they're a bit of an outlier in terms of the, the, um, the relationship between economic development and um, the gender gap index. On this figure, I've plotted a regression line. So it just shows you that there is a positive association between gender equality and economic development. So as incomes rise, societies um, tend to become more equal in terms of differences between men and women. Um, the, so that relationship is strongly statistically significant, but it's not all that steep. You know, there's a lot of other things going on that determine gender equality in, in any country. And what I think is interesting is, once you get above about 35,000 um, international dollars per year, per capita, um, most, almost all of the countries have a gender gap index of above 0.7. There are a couple of exceptions, but that's pretty much the case. Whereas at lower incomes, there's a lot of variability in terms of gender equality at the same level of economic development. Uh, and so what that suggests to me is that culture and or policy settings are potentially really important in determining the level of gender equality because you're seeing countries at the same level of economic development having very different experiences in terms of gender equality. 
So you've got some, you know, um, countries there with very low levels of income that are performing very well, Rwanda, for example. In this figure, I've just uh, limited it to the countries in Southeast Asia. And you can see within Southeast Asia, Indonesia is um, one of the, well, it's in the middle of the range, really, but maybe on the lower end. Of the so if you look at the previous slide, you can see that Indonesia is pretty much in the middle of the range across all countries and also in the middle of the range in terms of um, gender equality uh, given its level of per capita income. So within the region, it outperforms Cambodia, very similar levels of gender equality to Cambodia. Um, it outperforms Malaysia and Brunei, but performs um, less well, so has higher gender inequality uh, than the Philippines, Timor-Leste um, and Laos in particular, and Singapore, of course. Um, so the two, um, the two, two, well, two of the three countries that Indonesia has um, less gender inequality than are uh, Malaysia and Brunei, which are both uh, majority Muslim nations. So in the next figure, what I do is I um, contrast Muslim majority nations with, um, with other nations. So Muslim majority nations shown in um, blue. And you can see that gender equality does tend to be lower in um, countries where the majority of the population are Muslim. And in terms, in, in comparison to the Muslim world, Indonesia is actually performing very well. It's one of the, um, it has one of the lowest levels of gender equality for a Muslim majority nation. I think there's, let me see if I can remember, there's Albania, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and there's a fourth country. They're the only four countries that have lower gender equality that are Muslim majority nations than Indonesia. Um, so that's just so just to summarize Indonesia is pretty like in the middle of the field in terms of gender equality for its standard of living across all countries and outperforms most Muslim majority nations. So that was looking at the overarching index. Now if we look at the components that make up that index um, and here I've, I've graphed them just for um, Southeast Asian nations. If you look at educational attainment or health and survival Pretty much all the countries are performing in the region are performing well on those, as is Indonesia. If you look at political empowerment, Indonesia is pretty much in the middle of the range. So Indonesia is the red dot in these, um, these figures. Um, but it's when you look at economic participation that Indonesia really underperforms. So that's in terms of women's labour force participation. So that's really dragging down um, Indonesia's performance in terms of the gender equality. Um, Indonesia only outperforms Malaysia in terms of economic participation in the region. Now that economic participation index, where do I need to go? Over there? Oh. There we go. So what this figure shows you is this, these are the indicators that make up the economic participation index. So, so I'm just disaggregating another level. And if you look at these indicators, Indonesia um, it performs very well in terms of the proportion of, um, of professional and technical workers who are female. It's in the middle of the range in terms of legislators, senior officials and managers. Um, wage equality for similar work is kind of in the middle of the range. Um, but in terms of labour force participation, as I mentioned um, previously, Indonesia um, has very low female labour force participation compared to other countries in the region. And that also shows, shows up in terms of share of earned income, because if, it, if women aren't working, then they're not earning income, so they're uh, earning only a low share of earned income. So it just highlights, this analysis just highlights that Indonesia has low labour force participation. And so then the question is, why is that? And what can we do about that? Um, so female labour force participation has remained around just above 50% for the last two to three decades. And that's when you've seen a massive change in Indonesia. You've had, had a lot of industrialisation, urbanisation, increases in women's um, educational attainment. Um, but the figure on the right shows that just that's contrasting the labour force participation trajectory over age 
of married women in green with unmarried women in red. And you can see that married women um, just are participating in much lower income, at, at a much lower rate. Now that's not unusual, you see that across the world, but it's particularly stark in the case of Indonesia. Um, marital status and the number of children aged between zero and two um, are key drivers of women's decision um, whether or not to work. Um, and household responsibilities are a significant barrier to women's participation. So um, I've done some work with some colleagues at Melbourne Uni uh, using the Indonesian Family Life Survey, which enabled us to track, I think it was about 9,000 women across up to 20 years, observing them as they um, enter the labour market, as they have children, get married and have children. And we can look to see what happens in terms of their um, workforce tra trajectories. And so what you observe when you look at that data is that a lot of work, uh, women are not working one year after the birth of their first child. And what we found in particular was that losses are greater in the formal sector. So formal sector employment, so that's women who were working in the formal sector prior to having their first child, were 20 percentage points are less likely to be working in the year following um, the birth of their child. 3.6 percentage, there was a 3.6 percentage point reduction in the probability of returning to the labour market thereafter relative to women in the informal sector. And there were also just delays in returning to, the, um, to work. And anecdotally, people told us that, well, when pe women have children, it's really hard to juggle. If you have a full-time formal sector job, it's really difficult to juggle home and um, work responsibilities. And so people move to the informal sector. But in the data, we don't see that at all. We see, well, we see some women doing that, but mostly when formal sector workers, if they find it difficult to, to maintain employment once they have a child, they just leave the labour force. And so that's a real loss to Indonesia's productive capacity in that you have all these women, skilled women, who uh, end up leaving the labour force. Another facet of inequality, although the World Economic Forum Index showed Indonesia as being kind of in the middle in terms of wage inequality, um, there is still quite a sizeable gap. The raw gender wage gap, um, uh, as estimated in um, a paper uh, with another colleague at the at Melbourne University, was um, we estimated it to be thirty four percent in the formal sector, um, and we could only explain about thirty eight percent of it. So that means sixty two percent of the um, oh sorry, we could only explain twenty percent of it. So. 80% of it. So, so that meant that there's 20% of that is due to potentially due to discrimination in that we're looking at, at men and women who have the same level of education, same experience, same industry of, um, and occupation, and they're getting paid quite different amounts. And what was interesting in this study was that we found that the wage gaps were much larger at the bottom end of the distribution, as shown in the figure here. That, and they were, they were still sizable, but smaller at the top end of the distribution. And that's that's interesting because you don't always see this pattern. Say in Australia, the wage gaps, are, gender wage gaps are much larger at the top end of the distribution. Um, so that's just, just interesting in, in trying to understand what's um, what's driving these differences and um, you know the kinds of policies you want to put in place to ad address the gender wage gap. Another aspect of um, uh, gender domestic violence, where uh, women are predominantly the victims. Um, so in April, to do a similar kind of analysis, I wanted to, sh to compare Indonesia to other countries in terms of domestic violence. It turns out that's quite difficult to do. Um, the two sources of data I found um, allow me to look at um, attitudes to uh, domestic violence and also prevalence. So this figure shows you um, data from the World Values Survey, domestic violence, um, and so Indonesia is kind of, is um, is uh, considerably lower than, than some other countries uh, and some other countries in the region. Uh, but what's interesting in this figure is that you see that um, economic growth again is associated with reductions of, in um, domestic violence, and that's consistent. <laughs> 
with household resource and stress theory. So there are a, a number of, there are lots of theories on the causes of, of domestic violence. And of course, some or all cash transfer programs on domestic violence. And what we found is that house, well, the provision of cash transfers, which increase household, household income, were associated with decreases in domestic violence. Under which, if you're living in an environment where it's, there's very little income, that's very stressful. It leads to tensions within the household, conflict, and can lead, lead to violence. So increases in income can, that, can then uh, decrease domestic violence. Um, there are other, other theories that suggest that increases in income could actually increase domestic violence um, due to um, what's called status inconsistency or backlash theory, in that men feel threatened by their wife earning more. For women to work while having a family will increase women's income, increase the nation's income, increase household income, reduce conflict in the household, and ultimately decrease domestic violence. So there are lots of reasons to encourage women into the labour force. Um, so how do we encourage women into the labour force? Well, there's a whole set of policies that have been used internationally and have shown to be relatively successful. Basically, it's not rocket science, it's just about making it easier for women with children to work. Um, and that involves uh, allowing women to work flexible work hours, um, the ability to work from home. So we've seen great gains in, re in relation to the ability to work from home. The ability to work part-time, um, I actually, for 21 years, I have worked three days a week. I just work three days a week. I have three children. They're older now, they don't really need me, but I love working three days a week. Um, but that has just made a massive difference to my life. Um, and so being able to do that uh, really encourages women who might otherwise choose not to work, to work. Um, provision of paternity leave, um, so that husbands can share childcare um, with their wives and give their wives the opportunity to work. And also childcare provision, because you may want to work, your household might be supportive of you working, but if you can't find somebody to look after your children, it makes it very difficult to go to work. So they're the kind of you know, concrete policy implications, but also social norms play a huge role in whether women work or not. Um, so social norms, I'm defining them as societal informal rules about appropriate or acceptable behaviour. So if you can't, if social norms don't evolve, then all these policies are likely to only have limited effects on women's labour force participation. So in um, an ongoing research project, we seek to examine whether it's possible to influence social no norms in support of women working. Uh, and so that, as I mentioned, that's um, uh, a collaboration with Deanna and uh, Rory, and it's ongoing work. We don't even quite have a working paper yet. Um, so I'll just run um, through the results of this paper because I think they're quite promising. Um, so, so um, women's role as caregivers constitute a barrier to women's labour force participation. That's clear. Um, there's very little evidence on how to change gender norms. So um, there are a couple of studies that try and um, talk to women and their families about the benefits of women working, and they've largely failed to change gender norms. And then there's two papers in uh, Saudi Arabia where they correct people's perceptions of the extent of support for women working. So basically they asked men, do you support, um, are you supportive of women with children working outside the home for pay? And, um, and then they ask, they ask um, men to estimate how supportive they think their men in their neighbourhood are of women working for pay outside the home. And what they find is that a lot of men actually report being supportive themselves. But when they, when they estimate the extent of support amongst their peers, they significantly underestimate that. They think there's not much support. And then what they do is they tell the men, actually, there is a lot of support. It, you know, we did this survey amongst the men, you know, in your neighbourhood. 
this percentage. Uh, you know, it makes me more supportive. And then, and so they actually track that through and they see that it results in increased labour force participation of the wives of these men. So what we do is, is a very similar thing in the context of Indonesia. So in Indonesia, um, social norms in Indonesia are, are actually pretty conservative on this point. So they're comparable to Saudi Arabia. So 43% of Indonesian men, um, when surveyed, state that they prefer women to stay at home rather than work. That's the same as in Saudi Arabia, and it's, um, it's more conservative than in India. 76% of Indonesian men and 74% of Indonesian women agree with the statement that men have more right to a job than women. That is really very high by international standards. In Australia, only 7% of men and women agree with that statement. In Thailand, only 30% agree with that statement. And what's particularly concerning is that you see this increasing conservatism in Indonesia. So that same question asked in 2006, only 65% of men and 42% of women agreed with that statement. So you've seen increasing conservatism conservatism among men and a massive increase in conservatism among women so that they're now as conservative as men. Um, and young adults continue to conform to women having prime responsibility for childcare and domestic activities. So what we do in this paper is we run two online surveys. The first online survey is just to find out more about social norms in Indonesia. And the second online survey, we run an intervention which tries to correct misperceptions um, about women's support for women with children working, men's support for men sharing childcare, and older women's support for women with children working. So the first online survey is, um, it was just over a thousand individuals were surveyed. They all live in urban areas. They were married, aged 18 to 40. They live with their partner had dependent children and had at least a junior, junior secondary education. We asked lots of questions about demographic variables and we also collected in, information on their own attitudes and their perceptions of others' attitudes. Oh, so some of this has disappeared. This, this um, slide just shows you, so all the respondents were asked to nominate up to three reasons, and they could say they didn't have any reasons, but up to three reasons why they would not support women working. And the red bar corresponds to um, people responding that they're not supportive of women working because women's role is to care for their children. And you can see that's the most oft reported um, category by men. 22% of men report that and 17% of women report that women's role is to care for their child and that's why that's a reason for not supporting women working. Um, the only, interestingly, for women, 24% of women say it's difficult to find someone to look after their children. So that's actually the most oft reported um, reason for women. Then we ask um, the respondents, so 50% of men, 50% are uh, women, are you supported, supportive of married women with children under 12 working for pay outside the home? And 62% of the male respondents report being supportive. And then we ask men and women about their perceptions of men's support. And men believe that 59% of similar men are supportive, and women believe that 64% of men similar to their husbands are supportive. So basically, they, they nailed that question, right? Like that's very accurate. So there aren't misperceptions to be addressed there. So we, we leave that. Now we're looking at, then we ask, we ask the same question of women, and 76% of women report being supportive of women working for pay outside the home. Um, and then we ask men and women, what percentage of women do you think are supportive? And women said that only, they thought only 67% of women are supportive, and men said that they believe that 59% of women are supportive. So here we are seeing underestimates, not huge underestimates, but underestimates of the extent of support um, for, amongst women for women working. So we're going to target that in, in one of our interventions. We also asked, are you supportive of husbands sharing childcare with their wives? And can you believe it? 90% of men report being supportive um, of sharing childcare with their wives. That's very high. Um, but then when you ask 
men and women to estimate the level of support for shared childcare. Men estimate that only 65% of men are supportive and women estimate that only 64% of men are supportive. So there's a really large underestimate of the extent of support for shared childcare. So we're going to we target that in the interventions. And finally, what we did is we asked respondents if there was anyone who would, does not or would not support you if you're female or your wife if you're male working for pay. And you can see the most oft reported group are mothers closely followed by mothers-in-law. So both men and women report that their, their mother um, and or their mother-in-law um, is not supportive. And then in other questions, we ask them if, that, if they're concerned about that and how important it is to get their mother and mother-in-law's approval. And it turns out it's very important. So we, we target that, as you'll see in a second, in the third um, intervention. So I'll just move on. This just summarises what I've said. Um, so then we conduct our second online survey. Um, it's the survey, the sample is um, selected in the same way. 50% men, 50% women, but now we have almost, well, it's well let's say 4,500 um, observations. So it's much larger. And we randomly allocate uh, respondents to one of three different treatment groups or a control group. So there are four groups. So it's a randomised control trial. If you're allocated to treatment one, so everybody answers a whole range of survey questions. And then if you're allocated to treatment one, you also get this screen. So it says, in a previous question, we asked you to estimate how many out of 100 Indonesian women with an education level similar to yourself support wives with children under 12 working for pay outside the home. And then the screen shows them XX, their estimates. So say the woman had said 50% when they, were, um, when they were asked to estimate. The screen tells them, oh, you estimated that this figure was 50%. But then it goes on to say, we surveyed married women with children with similar education level as you across urban Indonesia to assess their support for wives with children working, blah, blah, blah. And the survey found that 76% of women are supportive. So it's showing the individual that you're really, uh, that they're really underestimating the level of support. Now, if you're in treatment one, that's the end. Um, if you're in treatment two, you see the, that screen, but you also see this green screen, which which um, presents similar information, but now it's about husbands sharing day-to-day -day childcare. So in the example here, the, the person is, um, is told that you estimated that XX percent, say that's 50% of husbands are supportive, but we surveyed men and 90% and of men indicated that they were supportive. So again, they're seeing how their estimate compared to what the research found. And then if, you, if you're in treatment three, you get the blue screen, the green screen, and then you get this orange screen, um, which, which is about, this is the one that's targeting the, um, the opinions of mothers and mothers-in-law. So we didn't interview mothers and mothers-in-law. Um, so we had to go to the World Values Survey just to try and work out what their, what their opinions are. And so basically what we ask people in the survey to estimate how many women in your mother's generation would agree with the statement that when a woman works, her children suffer. So that's a statement from the World Values Survey. And then um, we, we tell them, um, and so they estimate that. And so we show them their estimate. And then we say a representative survey of Indonesian women found that your mother and mother-in-law's generation are actually quite supportive of women with young children working for pay outside the home. Less than 10% of women in your mother's generation agree with this statement. Um, then, we, we, then we say that um, 25% of all respondents are going to be randomly selected to receive a gift. Um, now, if you're selected, how would you like to be paid? Would you like to be paid in terms of getting a, a 100,000 rupee shopping voucher? Or would you prefer to get access to an online career mentoring course, which provides women with practical career advice and tips from HR professionals? Um, and so the idea here is that if those seeing those coloured screens has affected the, the, how supportive the respondent feels about women working, you might expect to see more respondents choosing to get the um, career mentoring course than the shopping voucher if they're in those, if they're in those treatment um, arms. 
So that's what we do. We just look to see if more people in the how the treatment arms affect uh, um, this choice relative to the control group. And the bottom line is that it had a big impact. Um, the probably if you're in a treatment arm, any treatment arm, those respondents, men and women, were more likely eight point six percentage points more likely to choose the career mentoring course. That's a 25% increase in support for women working, which is really large. Um, all three treatments are effective for men and women. Um, so you can see, in fact, I might show you here on a figure that for women, you can see each treatment increases the, the impact so, you, so going from treatment one to treatment two, you're adding um, support, information about the extent of support for childcare. Going from treatment two to treatment three, you're adding the, the information about the support amongst the mother's generation. And you could see that for women, finding out about the mother's level of support increases the probability that the female respondent will choose the, um, the career mentoring course. Whereas for men, the information about mothers doesn't seem to have the same impact. In fact, the, the, it slightly decreases uh, the probability of choosing the uh, career mentoring course. And then we look here, this, these are results just for um, male respondents, for wives working. Um, so a male respondent whose wife works versus male respondents whose wives don't work. Um, and um, what you can see is we're finding particularly large impacts for men, male respondents whose wives aren't working, particularly around treatment too, that, that information about the um, support for, uh, for uh, share, amongst men for shared childcare. Um, so, so if you're in treatment too, you're male and your wife doesn't work, you're almost 15 percentage points more likely to choose the career mentoring course. So that's a 50% increase. So that's really large. Um, so, um, so, add, so to conclude, this very simple light touch intervention increased um, support for women working by about 25%. Um, providing additional information on support for childcare strengthened the effectiveness of the message, messages Women appear to be more swayed by mothers' attitudes than men. And the information on other men's support for childcare seems particularly important to men whose wives don't work. And so in terms of policy, in terms of policy, um, that means that, that a public information campaign along the lines of, of what we did in our intervention, just um, uh, communicating the extent of support um, in the population for women working and for shared childcare um, can change attitudes. Uh, large treatment effects were found for men, especially for men whose wives were not working, which is really important because 20% of women in our sample who weren't working reported that was because their husband did not want them to. So if you can change men's attitudes, you're likely to see changes in women's labour force participation. And then we did some back of the envelope cal calculations, assuming the same um, labour force elasticities as were found in um, the, the Saudi Arabia paper. And um, our calculations suggest that through interventions such as this, you could see an increase in Indonesian female labour force participation at, by as much as six percentage points or more than 10%, um, which may not sound like that much, but Indonesian um, female labour force participation has remained around 53% for decades. So if you're able to increase it by six percentage points, that's quite a significant finding. Um, oh, and yeah, just to, to finish off, changing social norms, hugely important, but can't be done in isolation because if you change social norms and women want to work, um, but they're reporting that they find it difficult to find someone to look after their children, then you're not going to see action. So you, so you need a multi-pronged approach where, where you're providing childcare, you're um, enacting policies in the formal sector that encourage women to stay in the workforce um, while also changing social norms. And that's it. So thank you. I've um, undertaken in my time quite a lot of other gender related research, which is listed there. Always happy to have discussions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lisa. I think the main takeaway is that we need to make it easier for women to work because it's, you know, uh, it's improving other aspects of gender equality and also um, providing good environment for women to work is actually important, including uh, providing, uh, you know, social, challenging social norms and challenging social norms is actually possible with even with a light touch intervention, we can actually change, uh, sway the social norms. Now I would like to invite uh, the first discussion. Uh, Nikki, would you like to give your remarks? Um, hello everyone, um, I'm Nikki and first of all I'd like to of course thank um, Professor Cameron but I'd also like to um, extend my um, deepest gratitude to Professor Tapariwa Sadli and Prof Mailing. Your work and strength I guess for gender equality is the reason why I'm standing here today as an economist, as a woman in a world that used to be dominated by men. <laughs> so thank you so much to Professor Sadli and Professor Mailing. Um, your work, of course, is inspirational. And um, today I'm hopefully adding a little bit to um, Professor Cameron's um, already really intensive and great work and some other considerations um, that could probably extend this work and inspire other researchers. I mean, it's inspired me. So um, oh, just, a, just a, a couple of words. <laughs> I guess these are just the bits that really interested me and that sort of struck me. Um, first of all, I was really interested in the bit where you did um, the really short systematic review on work on gender uh, around the world in Indonesia. I think that highlights that it wasn't, well, it was, it was people were less, less interested in it, but there's like a measure, um, a message of hope that people are starting to get more and more interested in gender. And of course, um, you, you've done a lot of work um, on it. And as a person who does a lot of work on measurements and index building, um, another message that struck me was when um, you were using different um, sort of measures of gender e equality and also comparing it to GDP. And there was a message in the paper to say that um, um, sometimes um, a country's level of GDP doesn't really ref reflect what policies and reforms it does towards gender equality. So in my line of work, that sort of highlights the importance of maybe um, measuring progress in a different way, rather than using just main GDP numbers, maybe um, measuring progress with, uh, that um, actually reflects changes that are inclusive. So when we say growth, um, who is growth for? So um, ideally, what we're measuring should be um, growth for all, so a gendered like GDP index, or what I've been working on, well, a lot of my colleagues are working on, um, are gendered measures of um, poverty and inequality um, that includes um, indicators and domains that shows progress, not only uh, in achievements for all, but it sort of de delves deeper in achievements for women um, and, and men. Um, and so that was something that struck, struck me. Um, um, I know there are a lot of indices uh, of gender e um, equality, but um, the paper touched a lot on the uh, World Economic Forum's um, global gender gap. And I was just looking at the domains and indicators, and I know you did too, Professor Cameron, and that um, was very insightful for me, not looking at the overall score, because um, when you're only looking at the ranks, um, Indonesia's achievements in the different indicators on domains are completely different. So the paper focused a lot on labor force um, participation and the indicators within labor force participation. It's not that big, um, this slide, I mean, I wish we could zoom in, but um, that's a bit complicated. Um, I'm, I was just comparing Indonesia and Malaysia, and because it's a gender gap index, um, a country fares well if there's no difference between the genders, but we have to remember that um, if both genders do horribly, then it's shown, the country is shown to do well. Um, for example, like in tertiary education, there's still a really low level of um, um, participation with regards to both men and women. Um, 
the index shows the parity in Indonesia um, and also um, Malaysia and other ASEAN countries, um, but it's something that we still need to, I guess, focus on. Um, so, and also because the index also focuses somewhat on ranks, um, it then depends on what other countries are, how they are doing, and that then defines your own rank. So I guess it's just, a, as, a, some, as somebody who measures and uses indexes a lot, it's just a word of caution with regards to um, what measure you're using and whether the measure is actually reflecting what you actually want to measure, basically. And um, I guess another, I guess, alternative measure which um, might be relevant for maybe further research, but not the re this, this research, which is to complement or supplement measures of gender gaps with measures of um, empowerment, so for both men and women. Um, here we have an index of women empowerment um, um, uh, established by um, the work that um, Sabina Alkaya and the Office of Poverty and Human Development uh, Initiative does. Um, it measures empowerment in different domains. I mean, I know Indonesia doesn't have, I guess, they did a, a separate survey on this, and Indonesia doesn't technically have like survey data that covers all these domains, but we could probably do proxies with um, Susanas and also the Susanas um, uh, Social Budaya, so um, um, education and social and culture um, module. Um, and then um, another thing that's good because we're measuring individual level empowerment is that it's, um, it enables us to also show intra-household inequalities. So ju not just looking at um, gender gaps and inequalities like at the national level, but also what's happening at the household, which um, I think is really important um, to kind of uncover. And then... Um, I guess it was also really interesting for me to know the reasons behind uh, why women choose not to work. So, um, and the surveys that you've done are, were very interest, uh, in, interesting. And um, and it's. Uh, um, um, I also noticed that um, ma the main reasons is for women not to work is because they um, they move from formal employment to care but they also then not choose to work in, inf in the informal sector too. So which is um, very interesting, but I guess another thing is, um, I guess it's also important to recognize that caregiving is work in itself, I guess. Women choosing to caregive, I mean, um, I know sometimes women choose to do that, so it's important to understand why they choose to move into, into care. And, and because of COVID-19, it's. I guess not only childcare, but also care in general, because due to COVID-19, the burden of care then of the elderly and the sick within the household also tended to go to the woman. And then I guess another issue is, even if women participate in the labor force, where would that burden of care be, basically? Will, there, will it be shared uh, between the husband and or anyone in the household? It doesn't have to be the husband and the wife. It, could be the mother-in-law, as you as you as you um, showed. So basically, if um, so, so I guess helping women participate in the labour force is then should not be the end of the policy, but also figuring out how care burdens are shared within the household should maybe also be highlighted by equality campaigns and governments, basically. And basically, um, the. What my main take from this was it left me wanting more and more, which is, of course, really great. So I wanted to read more about um, gender issues and um, so what would happen and where would Indonesia be if, if we weren't only looking at gaps, but also looking at um, empowerment measures and, um, um, and another sort of, I guess, eye-opening thing is if we look at inter-household inter inequalities, how is shared uh, how is care shared within the household and who makes the decisions basically in the household. That's, um, so, although we might not have the data currently, but maybe surveys and your work on little mini online surveys could probably help with that. And then reasons behind um, inequalities and what sort of norms and cultures actually prevent these inequalities. And then actually another thing that um, also came to mind was this idea of changing 
like social networks and familial ties when we sort of urbanize and embrace globalization and all this in the internet of things and everything and how then that also affects um choices of care and also whether as women we 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 are willing to work so a lot of questions coming from this piece of work uh, uh, that i guess it's really inspiring um so before i end um so when i was <laughs> when i was reading through the paper and i sometimes discuss things out loud <laughs> and i have my 3 year old son with me <laughs> and he brought me his favorite current favorite book which is called feminist baby he's a feminist too <laughs> i guess this sort of um hopefully ties to your idea and ibururi's really apt um conclusion to say that um even pretty simple interventions can lead to um big i guess or a significant impacts with regards to empowerment and equality and um starting with education from an early age hopefully would be something um would be would be helpful when for the government to consider and um and yeah um i guess that's from me uh, and and of course like published papers with regards to um gender and more and more published papers like the work that you both are doing um is of course helping breaking down walls which my little 3 year old always says feminist baby is breaking down walls <laughs> that's his current mot- that's his current um life motto so thank you professor camera and <laughs> thank you everyone <laughs> thank you so much nick it's very interesting uh, uh, the picture with 3 year old um now i would like to invite pak asep monggo pak Thank you, uh, Rory. First of all, I would like to thank uh, LPM, FABUI, and Indonesia Project NU for having invited me to become a discussion of uh, very interesting and very important uh, paper from Lisa. Uh, secondly, I also would like to pay respect to Professor Safari Nasaldi and Professor Mailing or Gardiner. whose work on gender issues have uh, inspired uh, many of us here. Uh, I really enjoy uh, reading uh, Lisa's paper. Yeah, I learned a lot uh, from it. And from reading it, uh, I find that the paper has uh, four main messages. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, main message is that gender equality in Indonesia is about where we would expect given the country's level of development. The second main message is that Indonesia has more gender inequality than some neighboring countries and uh, less than others. The third main message is that Indonesia has less gender inequality than the vast majority of Muslim majority regions worldwide regardless of the level of income. And the last uh, main message uh, of the paper is that Indonesian women's economic participation is low relative to Indonesia's level of development. So I see from these four uh, main messages, the first one and the third one are quite positive. Uh, the second one is maybe neutral, yeah? only the last one which is uh, negative. So based on that, Uh, in my view, uh, this paper has a relatively moderate view on gender equality in Indonesia compared to others. So here I put uh, three quotations about uh, gender inequality. Uh, the first one from uh, Ibu Bintang Puspayoga, the Minister, the Minister of Women Empowerment and uh, Child Protection, who was quoted Uh, last year to have said that uh, this gender inequality is caused by the deep-rooted patriarchy influence uh, social construct which has caused women to be left behind in terms of access, participation, control, and benefiting from development. Uh, the second quote is from Antik Bintari from uh, Universitas Pajajaran. She said that 
uh, the government and the institution focus on women empowerment simply reinforces the outdated understanding that gender issues are not mainstream and do not cut across all sectors. And the last one is from uh, Muhammad Shukri, uh, a colleague of mine at Semeru. Uh, he said in one of his papers that uh, the government policy, instead of transforming those unequal gender relations, uh, it has actually perpetuated them. Yeah. So compared to this uh, statement, the paper is, is, is quite uh, moderate and positive, I think. In addition to the general impression, I have uh, comments on two specific points of the paper. The first one is on the female labor force participation, uh, which is low. So uh, I try to look at the data yeah, uh, globally from various countries and uh, get this figure. It seems uh, that this uh, Low female labor force participation is indeed low uh, for Indonesia, but it is not unique to Indonesia. Uh, we see here that in 2021, Indonesia has about 44% of uh, female labor force participation. It's only slightly less than the US with uh, 55%. And the world uh, average is much, much lower at just uh, about 46%. Yeah. And the Philippines, which is called the star performance uh, in, in Lisa's paper in terms of gender gap, uh, global gender gap index, actually has much, much lower uh, at about just uh, 40, 43%. Yeah. Uh, within ASEAN countries, uh, Singapore and Thailand uh, indeed has much higher uh, participation with 59 and 58 percent and in Asia I think in Asia Pacific uh, China and Australia uh, they have uh, the highest uh, rate at 62 and 61 percent so I'm not saying that this uh, data say that uh, low female labor force participation is okay Rather, the speaker says that uh, it seems that the problem is, is, is global in nature. So maybe some kind of global cooperation is needed if you want to uh, overcome this problem. In addition, when I try to look at internally uh, within, uh, across uh, provinces in Indonesia, I find that some provinces in Indonesia have quite high female labor force participation. Uh, the highest one is uh, in Bali, and second one is uh, in Yogyakarta, and uh, the third one is from uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur. They actually have female labor force participation uh, which are higher than uh, China, uh, Australia, and, and Singapore. Uh, the lowest rate was found in Sulawesi Utara, and the second one is uh, Jawa Barat, where we are located now. Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe this figure uh, tell us that in addition to learning from uh, other countries, maybe we also can learn something from uh, our own uh, provinces here, especially from the one with have high uh, female labor force participation. The second uh, specific point that I would like to comment is on the social norms. The paper said that social norms play an additional important role in women's low economic participation. My question is, where do these norms come from? Yeah. The, the paper says implicitly, yeah, didn't say explicitly, implicitly that these norms come from uh, religion. So in the left graphic, I plot the proportions of Muslims population within each province with the uh, female labor force participation. Indeed, the fitted line is uh, downward sloping, yeah? but it is not quite strong. We see, if, if we look at the far right, 
these are the provinces with then with more than 95 percent uh, Muslim population. The number of provinces with low uh, female labor participation is almost the same as the number of provinces with high uh, female labor participation. In addition, some provinces with, with high uh, Muslim population have high uh, female labor participation. I have mentioned uh, the Yogyakarta and also Nusa Tenggara Barat. Yeah. And another outlier is uh, the province with uh, quite low Muslim population, uh, Sulawesi Utara has the lowest uh, female labor participation uh, in the country. So it's, it, it is some puzzle actually, yeah. Uh, secondly, originally I thought that education will some kind uh, neutralize uh, these uh, social norms. So I plot the years of schooling, uh, the average year of schooling uh, within each province uh, and uh, plot it with the female labor participation. And surprisingly, the relationship is negative. So education, instead of neutralizing this uh, uh, social norms, actually they make it stronger. Yeah. So maybe in, the, uh, in addition to the government policy, uh, there's also some, something that we need to look at uh, in terms of uh, education uh, curriculum. Yeah. Maybe there's something in it uh, which actually makes these uh, social norms uh, stronger. Yeah. So with with this, I think I end my uh, comments, uh, my discussion of the paper. And in the concluding remark, I just would like to raise two points. One is, I think the paper is a welcome contribution of uh, an economic analysis on gender issues in Indonesia. And secondly, since this is as the Faculty of Economics and Business, I hope the paper will uh, stimulate more research on gender issues by Indonesian economies, uh, myself included. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully uh, in the future we will have more than just uh, 21 economic research papers in a decade or just two uh, for years on April. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia. Terima kasih, Pak Asep. Just for in your information, I think our undergraduate students here are very in favor of doing gender equality uh, you know, analysis. Like so many of them are now writing scripts with the topic of gender equality. Um, now I would like to invite Lisa to provide response to the discussions. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, that was really interesting. Um, and I, pretty much I agree with everything you both said. Uh, oh, you can't hear. That better. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I agreed with the, all the comments that were made. I, w um, I agree about um, the indices and how it's important to understand exactly what you're looking at in the indices. In the, in the indices, and um, that index, I, the more I looked at it when I was already into using it, the more I looked at it, I thought, oh, that's not ideal. There was, but um, you know, as a summary measure, it, it does fine. Um, uh, let's see. I don't really have much to say in particular. Um, I think um, look. It, generating these indices, empowerment indices or gender inequality indices at the individual level and at the household level is really interesting. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's just a very um, uh, potentially really productive area of research. Um, oh, and also the, and recognising that caregiving is work, because I always do feel a little bit conflicted when I give talks about women's labour force participation 
And then I look at my life, right? And so it's not about saying that all women, all women should work. That's not at all how I see it. It's more that women should be given the option of working and then being given the option of sharing their caring responsibilities with other people, whether that be childcare that they outsource or with other household members and so forth. Because I actually am of the view that Working full time and caring pretty much full time is really exhausting <laughs> and is not something that you necessarily want to aspire to. So I just should have acknowledged that. Um, uh, and then um, turning to Asep's comments, yeah, I, I also I noticed that the Philippines does really well in terms of the gender gap index, but I also noticed that it did really poorly on women's labour force participation, which surprised me. I don't know very much about the Philippines. Um, but they do well on um, having women in senior roles. So that's why they end up, you know, on average looking um, as though they're performing well. But yeah, I'd be interested in knowing why their labour force participation, um, the labour force participation of women is so low. Um, and it is true when you look at the, like the figure that you presented, that Indonesians' female labour force participation is low, but it's not out of, you know, crazy low. It is kind of low within Southeast Asia. Um, but um, I guess you didn't have, I guess you look at countries when you do these um, international comparisons and it, it, countries like Iceland, Scandinavian countries that have all these policies in place that enable men to share childcare with women, to, um, you know, makes it very easy for women to work and you end up seeing very high labour force participation rates. So, um, so I think that's something to aspire to in terms of giving women choices um, and, you know, being able to balance um, work and uh, family, if that's what women want to do. Um, and this question, oh, and also, yeah, the variation across provinces, I have added a little bit of a revision um, because there was a suggestion to, to look at different provinces. And I similarly, it was really interesting looking at the different provinces because it wasn't at all clear cut in terms of, because uh, I think, I looked at, I can't remember which, pro, I looked at one province which is very conservative, but they have high labour force participation. So it's, it's not, it, I mean, I think that's an interesting area for research. If it, you know, anybody's interested in doing research in these areas, you know, trying to understand what does drive labour force participation in different areas of Indonesia, controlling for a whole range of factors at the same time to try and kind of nut out exactly what is, what is going, going on. Because, um, you know, culture plays a role, religion as it's part of culture plays a role, but I certainly didn't mean to imply that religion's the driving force in, um, in these estimates. Um, and in terms of education, that's also interesting because I think there's some evidence to suggest, and this is true in China, I think, from casual conversations, <laughs> that, that, um, that as income increases, that women, so, so as households income increases, households start to be able to afford to not have women work. So you can, so the relationship can be somewhat U-shaped. So as as women um, or families can afford to have the mother stay home and look after the children, you see that happening. And so labour force participation can actually decline over some uh, some phases of de economic development. Um, and education is is kind of in there playing a role. And um, in our work in Indonesia, we find that it's women with uh, senior uh, secondary schools, so SMR level, where um, women's labour force participation is at its lowest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so thank you for the comments and um, happy to hear questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. I see a lot of uh, Q&A already 11 on Zoom. But I would like to give the first opportunity for questions or comments uh, from the audience here. So I see one, two, and three. We do three offline and then uh, from Zoom. So the first uh, one, uh, lady in yellow hijab. Silakan ibu.
Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a very interesting and important lecture this morning for me. Yeah. All the presentation is very interesting. Even the implementation policy, policy implementation and discussion, all is very, very, very good and very great. Uh, Excuse me, but would you mind to introduce yourself, Ibu? No. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm Sri Wahyuni. I'm from the National Research and Agency of Indonesia, PRIN. Yeah, I'm under the uh, Circular Economics Research Group. Yeah. Uh, from this lecture, I would like only sharing about the fact about how to solve and how to implement all the implementation suggested in this lecture. Uh, one is as long as I see uh, what of gender equality makes uh, men get allergy to hear about gender, gender, gender. But actually, to solve the problem about women, we have to include men. So we have to make a strategy how in every event of talking about how to improve the women status or equality, we have to include men because they are, uh, they will know exactly what women uh, problem and from them we will get the solutions. That's uh, the important thing for me. And actually, um, the gender sorry, and oh, would you mind to keep it short because we have a line of yes, questions. Yes, this one, and the second is uh, we have to know about the feeling or and the uh, feeling or, or experience from the women worker, even though they already include in a labor have good status have more money, I think behind that achievement, women face so various problems that actually are not easy to solve. That's, uh, I think that's the important one. So we don't ask only the women who have no opportunity, but also to women who have opportunity already have, we have to know the problem behind their status. Right. Uh, I think Thank you so much. I can yeah, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Ibu. Um, let's uh, collect three and then And the next one. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Usain Akil. I'm a political science student in the University of Indonesia. So yeah, I'm currently conducting my thesis with the title, Jacinda Ardern's Policy in Combating the Poverty in Marginalized Community in New Zealand, Case Study Maori Women on Employment Sector 2017 until 2023. And it's really related to the, uh, the context of the presentation, gender equality and development. And unfortunately, the presentation ha hasn't given the context of marginalized women in Indonesia. So briefly, I would like to ask a question. Uh, how can we accelerate gender equality in Indonesia's development and also engage with women in marginalized communities? So because it's really important because Indonesia is a diverse country. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last, the third one, Silakan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Niken. I'm working in uh, non-governmental organizations related to health. Um, so now I will conducting the... Hi, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I'm conducting the gender assessment in uh, One Health for students related to uh, women's students' uh, participation to our training, to health training. 
uh, health capacity building. Do you have any suggestion or uh, input uh, to analyze uh, this assessment? Because this assessment will be implemented in uh, Aceh and Papua to see uh, the differences uh, between the two area that we will uh, willing to see how the gender participation or gender mainstreaming in a university level uh, happens or uh, implemented for uh, women students. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so you got all the questions? Would you like to respond? I'm not sure that I got the third one. Um, maybe I'll... I'll, I'll um, address the first two and then come back to the third. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I, I, um, I very much agree with the statement that it's, it's necessary to include men. I, re I think the conversation is really about households, about families, um, rather than about women in isolation. Um, I think in a country like Australia, where I'm from and was born, uh, you, we have high levels of um, female labour force participation and so we've kind of made some gains in some respect but we haven't made gains in terms of the sharing of responsibilities between husbands and wives and so I think that's really where the focus needs to be um, in countries like Australia and, and really everywhere in that men so now women have a right to maternity leave. It's quite common to work part-time. Um, but for men, it's actually difficult. So if, if you're working part-time, um, then it would be very handy when you're working, your partner could work part-time. But it, it's, it's, although it's possible for men to work part-time, say at the University of Melbourne where I work, you can just tick a box at the end of the year saying you want to go part-time. Like, that's it. <laughs> it's very easy. But nobody does it. Very few people, very few women do it. And um, I don't know any men who have ever done it. Um, and so social norms around men's role are hugely important in, in this um, area, of, um, in, the, in these issues of gender equality. Um, and interestingly, when we asked in our online survey, when we asked um, uh, men, um, men and women actually, about what they'd be concerned about if their, their wife worked, if the, if the mother worked. It was all about men's capacity to financially provide for their family. That's what it all came down to, which is so interesting because it's, it's, well, it's obviously related, but even the questions about shared childcare, you know, if you were to share childcare, what would you be concerned about? And it would be, women were concerned that other people would think that their husband couldn't financially support the family and men were concerned about the same thing. So that's really around, so that suggests that, you know, a reason that women aren't working or not working um, to the extent that they might like to is around social norms around men's behaviour um, as much as social norms around women's behaviour. Um, so I think that's an interesting area for future research. Um, oh yes, yeah, so how to how to think about gender equality and um, engage in with communities, marginalised communities. I agree that the um, the issues are are different for different for different groups in society. And in marginalised communities or communities where people have very low incomes, then labour force participation, for example, is not going to be an issue because people have to work to survive. Um, how best to engage with marginalised communities? That's not something that I feel like I'm in it. You know, I have the the you know that I have much to say on. I don't. I'm don't. I think that's for people in like in, you know with your work that'd be very interesting. Um, and people in, in Indonesia who know, the, know the, um, the communities and the situation much better than I do to comment. Um, but uh, it is true that, that, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. 
Uh, but I think if you, and, and I guess social norms differ across different areas and across different groups too. And so messaging um, to change social norms is likely to be more effective if it's targeted uh, to particular groups. But I do think that just a kind of nationwide campaign talking about the extent of support for women working could be quite effective as a kind of first pass. Yeah. And um, then the question about, um, so the research on Ache and Papua, did you get, I, I didn't quite hear. Oh, okay, so different, women's differential participation at the, at the university level in Ache and Papua. <laughs> I think that sounds like research that needs to be done. Um, you know, I don't really know where to start on that question because they're so, they're so culturally distinct, aren't they? And um, I noticed that, that labour force participation rates are very high in Papua, which I suspect is because low incomes, um, and they're low in Aceh, um, I know. Uh, so I think you set up an interesting kind of comparison there, uh, but I'd be, I'd be interested to, to hear what you find because, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, difficult to, to, uh, to know. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's another research agenda, yeah? <laughs> All right, now we will take uh, uh, three questions from Zoom. I have seen a lot of questions from Zoom. But Lydia, would you like to? Um, uh, let me uh, pose two questions from people listening from ANU in Canberra. They are related questions. One is from Fania Budianto who asks, um, do you also s uh, study social protection as such as PKH? Um, do you think the current PKH reinforces existing gender norms, especially in terms of conditionalities as female beneficiaries? Do you have data on conditionalities? Um, whether it uh, will act as double burden to po poor women in Indonesia. Her question is related to the question of Naomi Hartanto, who actually said that she is doing research on cash transfer in uh, Argentina. And study shows that the cash benefits decreases female labor participation as it reduces the economic need for women to engage in the labor force. So um, that's a really related really question from Fania and Naomi. And before you answer that, um, may I uh, call on Sarah Kanti, who is at the University of Adelaide, to ask directly her question. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Kanti. Uh, I'm currently a senior lecturer at University Universitas Pajajaran Bandung and also a uh, student at the University of Adelaide. And uh, I'm working on my thesis related to women's participation in intra-household decision-making uh, for the case of small holder farm household in West Java. So my question to, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, my question uh, to Professor Lisa is, um, you said that the survey was done online and could you please elaborate more from your findings about uh, who are the participants in the survey? Uh, is it more um, in the urban context or like uh, rural context or mix of it? Because interestingly, I also uh, found from my study uh, that social norms is very like important and have a very positive uh, association with woman participation in decision making in the context of farm household. So if you do the the context like in the rural and or in urban areas, it means that I can see that whether in urban or rural areas in Indonesia, social norm is very important to like an issue that is very important to handle the woman participation or woman empowerment in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
Uh, maybe one comment because this is from Anne Booth uh, from London. Uh, it's just a comment, but uh, because she is attending uh, on Zoom and it's very early morning in uh, London. Thank you, Anne. Um, which uh, mentions that Pak Asep raises an important issue in regards to uh, FL, FPR, female labor force participation across province, which are quite striking and rather difficult to explain. Perhaps Peru could do more work on this when the full results of the 2020 census are available at the district level would perhaps be possible. So that's, that's it. All right. Uh, do I respond to this? So the first one is about um, social protection. Yeah. I might just respond to Anne first, first while it's in the front of my mind. Um, so great to hear from you, Anne. I haven't uh, seen you for many, many years. Um, thank you for attending. Um, yeah, and I, I agree. I think it'd be really interesting to do research looking at, you know, variation across across um, districts or provinces in Indonesia. Um, so, you know, I think a student should pick that up and run with it, unless I run with it first. Um, then, um, oh, then next the question. Yeah, but hang, but hang. Um, so, um, so I think that's, I think in some sense, probably um, social norms in urban areas might be less entrenched than in rural areas. I don't know if people have views on that. So I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all if in rural areas you'd get, you could possibly get quite different results. I guess I see this study as looking at um, kind of uh, low hanging fruit, you know, and so where, where, it, where might it be, first of all, where might it be easiest to run an online survey <laughs> given it was during COVID? Um, secondly, um, uh, you know, where, where might you have the most purchase in terms of being able to change attitudes? Um, and I saw also that there was a comment on the chat that flashed up from Susan Olivia um, to asking about the online survey and response rates. And um, so we used a Qualtrics panel, which, um, so Qualtrics has a panel of people and actually they recruited more people for us. Uh, and so they just then send out invitations to participate in a survey. And we did have people, I don't know if you remember, <laughs> The exact numbers were because I don't, but we did have people, you know, not completing the whole survey, um, and um, but but they replaced, right? So we said we want a sample size of this size, and so they they end up replacing those numbers. So it's actually kind of we have thought about trying to do something on attrition, but it's a little bit difficult to know how to examine that where you you're replacing people and you don't know which observations are the kind of replacement observations. Um, then there's a question about Pekaha. Um, and um, mentions the notion that the mother's responsible for the child. It reflects what's seen in reality, that if you give money to women, then more is spent on children, and that's why they're designed in that way. But then it does reinforce those social norms. So, um, you know, it's an interesting question if you could get the same responses in terms of the development, the human development impacts of those programs, if you...
Studies find that that's not the case. Um, but you can see why, I guess it depends where a country is in its, in its, um, in its uh, development stage, in that if, if a cash transfer is being given to a, to a household and that enables them to afford for the woman not to work, you can see why they might make that decision. So, um, so that's interesting. But I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that's a widespread um, phenomenon. Um, I would also like to invite Pa Asep and Nikki. Um, I know that Smelu has extensive research around, you know, social protection, PKH. Would you like to share uh, your thoughts about, you know, whether like PKH is actually reinforcing gender norms? And maybe we, Nikki can also provide a comment. Yeah, uh, as Pufania promised, you asked about whether PKH uh, perpetuates the uh, gender roles. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we had a study on that, but it was quite a long time ago, yeah. uh, still the early period of, of PKH. And indeed, what we found at the time was uh, uh, men because the cash transfers were given to, to the women in the household, uh, men in the household tend to like uh, hands up on things involving uh, families and children, especially. Yeah. So, for example, when when the ta when there is a there is a time to register children to school, for example, uh, men would say that. You are the one who received the money, so you want to so are responsible for registering the uh, children to, to the school. And when there were occasions when children got sick, uh, men would refuse to bring the children to Puskesmas and said, well, you are the one who received the money, you are the one who have to bring her, him or her to, to the Puskesmas. Yeah. Uh, but since this was uh, at the time, the PKH was still at very early stage, and there have been some changes yeah, in the PKH, especially with the involvement with more facilitator, yeah, pendamping, uh, whether this uh, will actually improve the situation or not. I think uh, a newer research is needed yeah, in this area. Thank you. No, I, um, I think Pasep is the expert <laughs> on, on that. It's just that um, I'd like to say to Ibu Sarah Kanti, I'm really, really looking forward to reading your research on intra-household um, decision-making processes for labor households, because um, we're look, doing work on that, Ibu Ruri. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, we still have time until 11.55. I would like to invite again questions from the auditorium. All right, I see two, sorry, three. Sorry, we have three. So the first one is Jasmine, Dika, and a lady on the, my side. So we, uh, first, Jasmine, Silahkan. Thank sorry. Please keep your questions or comments. Okay, thank Sweet you. and short. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Jasman. I'm the former uh, researcher in Demographic Institute and the teaching assistant in this faculty. So my comments is about the methodological, methodological issues here of the online survey. So probably yeah, the, the study excludes the man who born before Replica 1 or probably the Generation X here. And then they who are blue color uh, sorry for the harsh word here, uh, low education attainment and computer literate. So probably the study is not perfectly uh, reflects the current situation, but the good news is maybe it may predict the future better because you probably the, the online survey probably they, they, they only include the those who are computer literate and probably they tax savvy and those born after uh, sorry, the generation Y, millennials, and probably the Z that already married. So maybe the, old, the study may predict the future better. That's from a methodological issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Dika, please. 
Uh, thank you, Margaret, for the opportunity. And uh, it's great to see you again, Lisa. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, enjoying the lecture and then learn a lot. And I think my question, if we can just spend a little bit of time of uh, how we address the childcare issue at scale. So I think uh, in your last uh, slide, I think it's very important that it is a very crucial issue to solve because if men are supporting women to work, but then at the end of the day, they have children and someone to have to look after the children and who's going to do that? And to what extent, uh, when looking at uh, Pa Asep's presentations, how labor force participation for women differ across provinces, is there something that we can learn from Bali? What's going on there? Is it because extended family really offer a lot of help uh, in uh, looking after children, especially before they go to school? And is there anything like an idea where it can be implemented in Indonesia at scale? Thank you. Rika and... Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Lita. I'm a student from economics major batch 2020. So my question is, uh, as we have seen, we see that how the social norms are still putting women as the one who take care of the child and family and putting men as the wage earners. And lately, Indonesia is considered as the third fatherless, is the world as the world's third fatherless country that is driven by the norms as well. Sorry, uh, can you put the microphone a little bit closer? Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, lately Indonesia is considered as the world third fatherless country and it was driven by the norms that putting men as the wage earner and women as the uh, uh, as the one who is responsible to take care of the family and the child. So uh, my question is, uh, beside of increasing the opportunities for women to do work while making them to be able to take childcare responsibilities, is there any kind of uh, policies that can be implemented to increase the men's role in childcare in the household while still doing their role as a wage earner? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's uh, linked to the first question about involving men in the policy. Um, Lisa, would you like to respond? And then I will invite again Nikki and Pa Asep. Um, I'm going to start from the end and go back again. Um, that's so interesting that Indonesia is the third fatherless country, whatever that means. I mean, I imagine that's difficult to measure, but I think it's interesting as a concept. Um, I'm going to think a bit more about that. But um, so how to increase men's ability to kind of engage in childcare, I think that's a difficult one. What they've done in Scandinavian countries is that they, they offer paternity leave but to men, well, paternity leave, so, and um, if they don't take it, they lose it. Because in other countries, you, you know, parental leave is offered and then it, then um, the mother can take it or the father can take it and so the, fa the mother ends up taking it. So it seems it's kind of important to offer men benefits that they can't pass on to their wives, that, you know, here's an opportunity to take leave, paid leave, um, and, um, you know, then that encourages them to be more involved in family life. I think there's, you know, um, at least in my own life, so my husband works part-time as well. He works four days a week. I work three days a week. And um, I think that early involvement, the ability of men to take paternity leave and then possibly work part-time, but even just taking that paternity leave means that the husband's involved with the children from a very young age and that builds confidence looking after the children because if the mother's always doing it, then the fathers don't feel confident to do it. So I think, I think that's really important, kind of getting men involved at very, when the children are very young. But um, it's, you know, I th and I think social norms are the, you know, a, a, they play such an important role. Because if you look in Australia where men can work part time, it's very unusual because men worry that they're going to be, they, you know, they're going to be, um, stigmatised in the workplace and looked like they're not taking their job seriously 
and um, so it makes them reluctant to to apply for leave or to work part time, even if that they would like to, if they didn't think that they were going to be judged in that way. So I think that's really important. Um, then there's a question about childcare at scale. Like, yeah, um, I just think it's such an important issue, and I think it's a fraught issue. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. So, you know, in Australia we have formal childcare and a lot of, most children go to formal childcare for some time. And, um, but even that, it's, you know, that's difficult. Childcare workers don't get paid very much. Um, and there, there are all sorts of challenges. So, and I, and I understand in the Indonesian context, there's not so much formal childcare. Um, but I also think from what I've read that there's more of an appetite for formal childcare than people might um, might uh, acknowledge. And um, so I think there is a role for formal childcare. Um, but I don't have the answers. I think it's, you know, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. And really you need a professional workforce and they need to be compensated well. And that's difficult to afford. <clears throat> Um, and the other question about, um, I wasn't sure I ca captured the gist of your question. So that was about generation, that, we've, that we're capturing Generation X in our data. So tell me if this answers your question or not, because also you're talking about, we've also, we're looking at junior and secondary educators, so individuals. So the survey wasn't designed to be representative, so it was designed to be picking up people. We, we targeted junior and secondary educated people because they're the cohort that seem to have the most discretion over whether they work or not. Or uh, once, you start, um, once you start looking at tertiary, so we've got tertiary educated people as well, 25% of the sample. Tertiary educated, we, women that the, the issues seem to be quite different and, and the lab, labour force participation is quite high in that group. So we wanted to focus on groups where there was kind of quite a variation in women's decisions whether to work or not. Um, and we just chose that age category, not so much thinking about that they'll, that they're, they're kind of, um, they'll play a role in, in future um, female labour force participation, but more because they're the people who have children now and are confronting these decisions now. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think in uh, for the childcare issues, I think like questions from Diga about the childcare, uh, what kind of best, best practices you know can be implemented in Indonesia, and also uh, policy for men, you know, to increase their you know participation in care. I think we can, I would like to invite Nikki and Paase perhaps from your research or maybe from personal perspective, you would have, I mean, you have uh, some insights about, you know, what kind of policies that can address this issue. Please. Thank you, um, Professor Lisa and Ibu Ruri and Mbadika and everyone with the questions. Um, and Mbadika pointed out that Bali had highest um, labor force participation. I'm Balinese, so just looking at my own community, in Bali, women do the work. But then it sort of highlights my earlier point with regards to um, it's, of course, really great for women to participate within the labor force, but it shouldn't be like an end. Um, we should also be thinking about if women participate, who carries the burden of care? In Bali, women work and cares for children. So, so it should be women participation and like um, how the burden of care is um, then distributed within the household, which co uh, comes back to that intra-household um, process and discovering what's happening within the household. So, so. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Dika. Uh, we have several studies on uh, care, uh, especially unpaid care, uh, and actually women are not only tasked to care for children, yeah, but they also tasked to care for the elderly member of the household and the six uh, household members. Yeah. Uh, and almost all of them, uh, the burden fell on women. Yeah. 
uh, but of course uh, children is one of the most uh, important one uh, and I think in several uh, our research location especially among the poorest uh, member of the society we find that uh, there are some kind of uh, community based uh, child care or other kind of care which uh, are developed by, by the community uh, to help with this issue because like what uh, Nikki said that in most cases women have to work and have to do the care yeah so but of course this is still uh, small in terms of scale and anecdotal in separate area but uh, I'm not sure whether we, we can develop it into uh, wider scales in terms of this uh, community-based uh, care, yeah? uh, children on and other uh, people who need, who need care. <clears throat> uh, and also uh, assistance which can help uh, women, uh, especially among the poor, can uh, reduce their, their burden like uh, like washing machine for example maybe it's just uh, we, we don't think about it yeah, for the middle class and upper but for the poor it's really a big help for them in reducing their, their burden yeah. uh, so if the uh, cost of owning a uh, washing machine is too, ex too, too expensive for one household it can be developed into a community-based uh, washing machine, for example. People take turn using washing the, the washing machine. So there are still, I think, uh, experimental uh, small here, here and there, which is not yet uh, developed. But it will be interesting to, to see it further, how it will develop in the future. Especially considering the diminishing role of extended family yeah, in helping the, uh, the core family. Thank you so much. Um, do we still have time? Can I ask? Um, Lydia said no? Nia said yes. <laughs> so I think let's take uh, one or one question from the Zoom because a lot of questions from Zoom. Nia or Mbak Lydia, would you like to? Yeah, uh, this is question from Lolita Morena. Uh, can you share how could firms policy could contribute in removing uh, gender discrimination and also female labor force participation around the world? Example, given there are some policies or uh, on removing gender discrimination vacancy, uh, is it successful? Thank you. Um, sorry, would you mind to re... Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, can you share how could firms policy could contribute in removing the gender discrimination and also uh, female labor force participation around the world? Example given there are some policies on removing gender discrimination vacancy ads. Is it successful? Okay. Policies for removing gender discrimination yeah. around the world. Is there any example? At the firm level. At the firm level. Yeah. Uh, well, I think one thing that firms can do um, is be, because gender discrimination is played out in a number of ways, like it's whether women get a job, whether they're promoted, whether um, they're paid the same amount. So in terms of the wage gap, it's very, that should be an easy problem to fir for firms to deal with, right? Just pay women the same as you pay men. Um, and what helps in that respect is pay transparency. So if you, um, if people know what other people are getting paid, which is, you know, can be quite sensitive, then it's very hard to get away with paying women less. Uh, and I was involved in that to some extent at the University of Melbourne, I, I was on our Equal Opportunity for Women in the Workplace uh, Committee many years ago and we got access to um, data on the salaries being paid 
by men and women. We're not individual men and women. Um, and that was really effective in enabling us to argue for change. Another thing to do is to, in terms of wage inequality, um, if you have very transparent rules around, say, who gets bonuses and what you get a bonus for, then it's, um, you're likely to end up with less gender inequality in wages um, if you apply those um, equitably across the workforce. So really, I think transparency goes quite some way. And then just having policies, um, particularly around maternity leave, I guess, um, that um, encourage women to, you know, that when we found in our research that formal sector women tend to be dropping out of the workforce, a lot of the discussions we had around that reflected the fact that people didn't seem to think that was an issue, that there are a lot of women, um, you know, and so why would firms want to hold on to employees? Why, you know, they, they're happy for the employees to leave and then they just hire new young women. So, um, I, well, I think research has shown that, that there, there are often benefits to firms for holding on to staff. You don't have to retrain staff. Um, so there are probably benefits to the firm from doing that. And, there, and the costs of trying to retain women are not, are not very high. So having policies that um, you know, enable women to come back after maternity leave, so take, you can take 12 months maternity leave, come back and you're guaranteed a position at the same level doing the similar things. Those kind of policies are really effective in um, reducing gender equality, um, inequality. Yeah, uh, talking about policy, uh, suppose uh, there is a couple, husband and wife, who both work, and uh, both have the same exactly uh, salary, yeah, the level of salary is the same. But the take home pay for the wife will be less than for the husband. You know why? It's because of the tax policy. Because in Indonesia, the tax policy, the household tax, income tax, is based on household, not based on individual. So the income of wife is added into the income of husband. So autom automatically, it will subject to the highest uh, marginal tax rate. Uh, so I think this is one area of policy which we need to look yeah, uh, further whether it has a significant impact or not uh, into the female labor post participation. Yeah. But I think uh, my, my guess is this is one of the important uh, area to look, uh, especially for the uh, economists who stay here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that just reminded me also that I think the minimum wage policy makes it very difficult for firms to offer um, part-time work because the minimum wage policy is on the basis of monthly wages. And so if you're working part-time, you're going to look like you're not earning the minimum minimum wage. At least that's, that's what I've been told. When, when you do, That's not true? Uh, but I'm not sure that that's widely, underst wi widely understood because when, when we we were talking about policy changes, a lot of people were talking about the um, the minimum wage legislation as being problematic in terms of offering flexible work. So if it's not, that's good. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, time is up. Thank you so much. Um, please uh, give round of applause for. Professor Lisa Cameron, Nikki, and Pa Asep for excellent discussion. Now I will return the microphone back to the MC. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you to all speakers, discussants, and chair for the insightful findings, as well as fruitful discussion on this issue on gender equality. Before we conclude the event, we would like to invite Bapak Firman Witular Karta Diputra from ANU Indonesia Project to deliver his closing remarks. Bapak Firman, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, the honorable colleagues, uh, Professor Saparin Nasadli, speakers, um, uh, discussion chair. Um, on behalf of the ANU Indonesia project, uh, I'd like to begin my closing remarks uh, by thanking everyone here in the audience uh, in Depok and also online and, uh, for your active engagement and for uh, making today's uh, event uh, 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 really uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, I also like to pay my respect to Professor Saparani, Professor Saparina Sadli, and also Professor Mei Ling Ui, my first mentor in uh, economics in UI. Uh, I would like to uh, use this opportunity uh, to say something about a new Indonesia project. Uh, some of you already knew uh, about us, and to inform you about the final uh, the output of this event. Uh, sorry. Um, next. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, of this uh, lecture, and also an announcement of one of our, the, uh, the upcoming Indonesia Update uh, conference. So Indonesia Project is um, a research center at NU that was established in 1965, where the primary objective is to promote a stronger uh, uh, research-based policy uh, through the activities that we conduct as the uh, academics, but also to the, uh, to the activities that we as a, a center uh, support and conduct. Uh, among the activities that, uh, that we conduct, uh, is uh, uh, is public uh, lectures such as the study lecture, and um, as I have been mentioned uh, before, uh, the uh, this is the 18th, uh, the 17th uh, uh, study lecture. Uh, this is the 17th time a new Indonesia project has co-hosted this lecture with uh, uh, LPM. Uh, FABUE with FAUE, um, and I would like to thank the uh, LPM, Bapak Haikal, uh, and also, of course, to Professor Chaprin Sadli and the family for their uh, continuing collaboration. Um, it's clear from the Q&A and from the discussion today that today's theme and the theme of this new series, to honor Professor Chaprin uh, Sadli, has been an issue that is close to everyone's hearts and everyone's minds, and in addition to, and in addition, it uh, looks like it's going to continue to be what looks like to be a very fertile ground of uh, research uh, uh, for many years. So this is uh, really terrific, and for that, I would like to uh, thank everyone involved, uh, Bu Meiling, who kicked off the. Uh, event with this, uh, such a uh, touching remarks, um, uh, a lesson in history, uh, to study lecture speakers, Lisa, uh, Cameron, uh, to also Geniki, uh, Paasep, uh, as a discussion, and uh, really for the very excellent uh, session. So this lecture and or the paper that uh, on which this lecture is based on will be published in the upcoming uh, BS, uh, Bulletin of Indonesia Economic Studies. So I look forward, we look forward to seeing the paper in print as I'm sure you all are uh, uh, also, okay? Um, and then I'm going, the one other thing I want to uh, mention is the, I would like to uh, use the opportunity to announce the upcoming Indonesia Update Conference, the 40th Indonesia Update. Uh, will be on September 15 to 16 this year, um, and it's going to take the theme of governing, governing urban Indonesia. The conveners will be uh, at Aspinal from ANU and Amarinda Safirani from UGM. Uh, so please start uh, booking your tickets and perhaps secure your visa uh, to be there in time. So uh, before ending my remarks, I would like to uh, thank the people who made uh, this event uh, uh, go as smoothly as it did. To uh, Vice Dean Bu uh, Lala, who's not present today, and to her team, to, uh, and also to Lydia uh, of the Indonesia Project. Uh, thank you, everyone. See you at the next event.